wonderful speakers uh, this morning. Actually, Wanda and Diva, I was the best person uh, to <laughs> take through the, the, the discussion. Uh, but because it's a participatory process, I think we want to take the next uh, round of four questions. Uh, we answer them. And uh, just before that, um, I would want us to agree uh, how long we take with this session, because it can be as long as 3 p.m. It can be as short as um, uh, 1.30 p.m. Do we agree on Yes. Yeah. One fifteen. Uh, so uh, you don't want to forget uh, what our speakers have. Uh, they are all doctors, and I hope we have uh, Doctor, Professor. Huh? Yeah, Daniel. Let me just uh, use that one. Eh? Uh, Daniel, with us, so that we hear uh, you hear uh, questions that are directed to you. Hear me? Um, uh, yes, I'm back online. From I'm back online. Do you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We do not want to forget uh, very important uh, um, presentations that have been made uh, in the morning session. Um, the sea is complaining. How many know that the sea is complaining? That we have a role to stop the, the sea from complaining. And therefore, marine spatial planning is key uh, for us as Kenyans and, and the East Africans uh, who are here and who are, who are not with us here. So we need a multidisciplinary, multisectoral approach to stop the sea from complaining. Then uh, there's a Fish Post Academy. I don't know how the enrollment is done. Uh, but we have been taught that we need to come out of the linear approach to a circular approach to the management of our cities and urban areas. Very important. Um, one of the challenges that I have got from this conference is, uh, from this convention is that as a director in charge of metropolitan development in Kenya, I need to link up with the counties uh, so that we work together to know how we integrate the trading blocks with the metropolitan regions that have been thought up in the, in the vision 2030. Very key. Uh, then uh, the Singapore example of relocating trees. How many were challenged? Relocating live trees, not small trees, not seedlings, but mature trees that could have taken like 60, 60 years to mature. Uh, so we have a challenge. We need to stop uh, uh, planning for dumping sites. We've even uh, elevated it to a sanitary landfill. We've done one in Muranga County, uh, just about to, to, to be completed and start thinking of how uh, we respond to waste in a more uh, sustainable manner. Then, uh, uh, Nyomba. Nyomba is uh, our doctor here, uh, challenging us on ecosystem-based management. And he again emphasized on the matter of stopping uh, the silo, silo way of dealing with issues. We need a, a very structured approach, a multi-sectoral approach to dealing with the, uh, with the ecosystem management uh, in, in this region. Uh, then uh, uh, the incentive to protect yourself. What is your incentive to protect yourself? Needs to be very clear and communities around us so that we, we, we also deal with the motivators of doing the wrong things. What, do you, what motivates you to do the wrong thing? Then you work backwards. Therefore, 
what do you do uh, to motivate yourself and the communities to do the right thing so that you do not get wrong with the, the nature. Uh, then, um, Prof, the last Prof who is online, talked about beyond our bare brains. Uh, who I think we all got stunned by that presentation as well. And uh, we need to be self-aware self and create self-aware smart cities. Uh, we now have to stop conquering nature, or what Dr. Rappers would call exploiting nature, uh, so that we, we feel, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a process where we want to feel, human beings want to feel more secure. Uh, already we have started feeling some kickbacks from nature. I think we need to stop those kickbacks and start having a real-time response and proactivity towards stopping the kickbacks from nature. So, and uh, I think all of us are still flying very high, but blight. Yes. Uh, so the population explosion is taking us to a place where the ecosystem will collapse. And when it collapses, then we have no fallback. Uh, so uh, with those highlights, I would want to take questions, the first uh, four questions directed, uh, panelists, please, just feel free to note down very specifically, because I'll not go back uh, so that we save on time. Uh, response time to a question is five minutes at most. Thank you. Plana Samuel Buru. Plana Samuel or Kelvin? You can do that. Let me bring you. Meanwhile, your program, your program uh, indicates the names of presenters. They are either doctor or professor. So don't make a mistake of, <laughs> of calling someone uh, <laughs> another uh, title. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, Plana Ann, Plana Ann wh what I know about doctors and professors, they actually don't like those titles so much. Eh? They like writing them down, but they would, Jackie would just like to be called Uku or Jacqueline. Jacqueline. Uh, Tobias would just like to be called Nyumba or Inzu. Just to mention but a few. Thank you. Uh, so, Uku, you are in the house. Thank I you. thought Swahili is also a national yeah. language, so I might uh, combine both English and Swahili. Uh, especially this question goes to Mr. N Dr. Nyumba. Bwana Nyumba, you told us about the ecosystem. Here in Malindi, I'm giving you a typical good example that I saw myself when I was young and I'm seeing it right now as an old person. We have these, what we had these seagulls, the birds that feed on the fish and they are found uh, mostly seen along the beach there. Nowadays, I assure you, even if we take a walk, you and I and others who would like to join us, we shall not find even a single seagull. But the reason is that we now have Indian house crow type of birds that have dominated all over this place. This is a sort of an interference on the ecosystem. What can be done so that these birds, these black birds, could, you know, give the room to the other birds also to survive? Nakwambia hata ukenda kule juu pia. We used to have uh, what you call um, various species of birds. Swifts, wale mbarawai, tunawita, love birds, walkuwako. These birds are no longer here at all in Malindi. They are not seen at all. So please, can you advise us on what type of uh, ecosystem we can do for the betterment of having these birds back. Nyingine, ni madam, daktari, ulele zunguza mwanzo. Na kuambia hivi, nyinyi mmechagua malindi, mmechagua mambasa, mmechagua nakwale. Lakini ilamu mmeyacha. Kwa nini ilamu kuyacha? Na wale wazewe tuwote, wale ukuwa mbavuvi, watoka lamu. Kwa nini ilamu kuachwa? Na kuulizo swala langu nilwa. Santeni sana, thank you very much. As I said earlier, I use both Swahili and English. Here I am. My name is Abdallah Ali, for those who do not know me. Thank you. Before we go to the next one, so I'm saying we, we are having four questions as you directed. Yeah, so I'll give this to Plana Kelvin to stand on the other side, and Plana Samuel will be on this other, on my right-hand side. And the 
as you respond, you just stand up and respond from the microphone here. Thank you. Thank you uh, for the presentations uh, we have had, uh, very enriching and, and give us, giving us planners uh, a perspective uh, to utilize in our planning. Uh, I have, however, uh, a few aspects, maybe uh, they are part of enriching and also may require clarification. So I'll start with the issue number one, uh, because for us planners, uh, we are dealing with the, what we want to see on our map. So like for the part of the sea that we have to plan, uh, we believe uh, the resources talked about, we would want to see uh, what are the types uh, of the resources. Uh, some for the animals like the breeding areas, yeah, the breeding areas uh, that, we, that can be mapped areas of particular species, yeah. if there are any shared spaces in the water of, of these species, uh, the movement uh, within, because if these are mapped out, then they give you uh, a reflection on how you can deal with them as a planner, uh, from the aspect of reflecting them on the, on the, on the space. Uh, and, and of course, then we are looking at the impacts, which, uh, of course, from man-made. And I think these ones tend to uh, reduce as you go inland. And, and therefore, uh, th those are important for us to, to kind of see, yes, w when you map out, w w where is the influence most felt uh, as you move into, in, into the sea? Uh, critical uh, for us. And, and then the balance of things, because whatever you find in the, in the sea is, is affected by, of course, there is the natural system, some feeding on the other, and they are able to balance out. Then you have these ones which have been affected uh, by a pollution. Uh, and then you have, again, the impact of man, if he, he or she is harvesting some of them. So that the kind of uh, equations there uh, for us to be able to utilize it sustainably uh, is very key uh, that should be arising from our research. Uh, and therefore, I'm also looking at the aspect of either hydrologic, hydrographic, uh, or geophysical surveys to be part of what accompanies uh, this kind of studies so that um, they are able really uh, to give us uh, the mapping, the mapping of, of issues uh, within uh, the, the area. Uh, of course, again, uh, we, we have talked about them, but also we are looking at the context, because what are our economic ideologies? As, as we look at the researches and the issues we are looking at, uh, our political economic ideology, of course, neoliberalism, and the issues of profits, with very little of sharing the profits uh, or, or other shared ideology of economy. Uh, it presents quite a challenge to what we want to do uh, with this whole exercise of marine resources, particularly the distributive aspect, which is a function of government, but is not working uh, properly. So uh, that area is, is very key. As we look at it, uh, that political economic ideology is very important because it again uh, relates even to the kind of laws you get. Because the kind of laws you get are actually determined by the political ide economic ideology. So they, they may, uh, under such a system, we may uh, not move very far. Then the other aspect will be Marine, the one of property rights. The, the next 30 seconds, please. Yeah, so the other aspect will be the one of property rights. Yeah, so who owns? This is spaces we are speaking about. Eventually, you may find uh, we have rushed and zoned out the sea for ourselves, especially those who are very powerful. And, and, and therefore, again, if you are speaking of sustainability, it, it may not uh, come out uh, uh, properly as such. And then finally, of course, I have a bit more, but I just will point one. Um, just point one issue. The aspect of um, uh, the philosophical angle, because uh, the presenter there mentioned about uh, the 
purely anthropocentric view uh, we have been projecting. And, and if we could map that anthropocentric outcome with the space, uh, it's, it's very important for us. And of course, we know we have others, biocentrism and ecocentrism, of course, which are now missing from our uh, aspect of relating that with the actual space that we see, so that uh, we are able to relate with this and see this is our problem, but it is because from the philosophical angle through which we have always approached and used uh, the resources. Eventually, uh, you have spoken about something of, uh, of course, ecosystem based. We in planning are looking at it from integration. And it is not very difficult, new to us, but an integrative approach uh, to the issues uh, is, is, is very uh, important. And even changing the policy to be integrative policy, not silo. Uh, based aspect. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think our, uh, that um, um, member or participant should have come <laughs> and have us <laughs> uh, sit here because you have just added a lot of value. Thank you. Uh, next. This side, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, the facilitators. Say your name, please. Uh, my name is Andrew Titi. I'm the county chief officer in charge of uh, urban uh, development and fiscal planning. My major area of concern is uh, on the solid uh, waste management, uh, which currently is becoming a very big challenge uh, to the growing cities, uh, municipalities, towns, and urban centers. Because what we've really encountered is uh, we've really found it very hard to manage that uh, objective uh, collectively because it's a, a responsibility that uh, the county government is being uh, uh, charged to undertake. Uh, the issue of land, uh, we found that uh, we have inadequate uh, parcels of land within uh, the jurisdictions of the cities, uh, towns, municipalities. And also, we found out that uh, if we could have had an approach whereby we also get some uh, partnership with the companies that can come and help to recycle what uh, has been collected. You've seen in Nairobi, uh, Dandora is really becoming a menace at the moment because of the issue of uh, uh, solid waste management. I think we need to really relook on how we can approach this uh, in order to have a sustainable approach for the future uh, planning of our cities. Thank you. Thank you. The last one, this side. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Alex Nthiwa, Makweni County, Chief of Urban Development. I have a quick question for Dr. Nyumba, um, uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, the anthropogenic causes uh, and the cyclical economy, I think somebody talked about the circular economy and the question of resources. When you want to balance the two, we want to conserve the marine ecosystems at the same time on the policy side, we want to uh, ensure that the resource use and exploitation and the different uh, stakeholders you talked about. So how do you strike a balance between the two? Because those are two competing interests, from one side of conservation and the other one from the policy side. Thank you. Thank you. We want to uh, our panelists to respond to those questions. Uh, we will start with uh, Uku. Then uh, uh, on and on. Uh, if I find a question not answered, then I will come back. So please use this. Yeah. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate uh, the questions from those who listened uh, to my presentation. 
and I'll begin by addressing the first one that was uh, targeted to me uh, by Abdallah Ali, uh, who asked, um, we seem to be talking about all other counties but not Lamu. And I'll just indicate that Lamu was actually uh, pioneering in the field of spatial planning. They're the first county to have developed a spatial plan, um, a county spatial plan. And uh, the only thing they did in that plan was leave out the coast, the, the marine waters, but they did develop a spatial plan with support from WWF. And uh, I know a lot was elaborated in the last planners meeting by the team from WWF. But it doesn't mean that we don't focus on uh, Lamu. We still have projects that uh, work with communities uh, focusing on different aspects. Um, I'll mention one that I was involved in where we have been looking at how communities relate with their ocean spaces. And um, I, did an, I did a resource mapping exercise with communities. I did not show that here, but we can engage over that. And it's very interesting when you talk to the real stakeholder, what they tell you about the space. They even tell you about dugons and animals that were seen many years back. And maybe uh, that may be the last space that we can see a dugon because they still get caught in nets uh, even today. So quite a bit is going on in Lamu and I believe once partial plans begin uh, being developed, a lot more will come up. Um, there was uh, some thoughts shared by my colleague about um, different resources, breeding areas. And I just want to mention that um, in a marine spatial planning process, we do take into account migration movements, especially of large marine mammals. We have whales, we have billfish, we have tuna, uh, also fish species that move across. So those uh, aspects are also looked into. And um, obviously partnerships are needed um, as we elaborated in the different talks uh, this afternoon. Then uh, there's been a question on, I think you raised the issue of uh, property rights, who owns what? And so I'll try to just indicate for a long time uh, the ocean has been op open access. Um, that is something I know fisheries has been looking into, but you could fish anywhere. But on top of that, uh, we do have areas that are zoned out. So if you're familiar with marine parks, those are areas that are zoned out. Malindi has a marine park and a reserve. So that is under the custodianship, not necessarily ownership, but custodianship of Kenya Wildlife Service. Under fisheries, we have regulations that allow beach management units to create co-management areas. Mm -hmm. And so we have several of those along the coast where they are custodianship of a unique space. And if you look on land, we have mangrove forests, so trees that grow in the sea. And we, there we have community forest associations also giving custodianship to how those resources are used and accessed. So uh, in as much as there's open access, there's still some kind of ownership on the ground at community level. I believe those were the issues that came up, uh, Madam Rose, so thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I identified one question from Plan Outiti. Did I, did I get your name correct? Regarding waste waste management, um, solid waste management in counties. And I would like to throw the ball back to your court. I believe that um, solid waste management is a matter of leadership or strategy. It is the onus of the county to decide on the strategy they're taking. Then the strategy that they adopt now will have implication on spatial requirements. If, if you do your research, I can't remember the, the name of the town, but there's one in Japan, 
that has taken a zero waste strategy. How, how many of you have heard of zero waste strategy? Zero waste means that you reduce waste at source level to a point that what goes into the landfill is almost zero. You either reduce it or recycle it. So when you take such a strategy, the need for a landfill becomes almost, land for a landfill becomes almost zero. But that is a, a decision that needs to be taken at a higher level because there are other um, policy strategies that need to come. For instance, I say in Nairobi, um, we teach our children reduce, reuse, recycle, plastics, metals, papers. But even if I, and because I attempted, even if I separate my waste, plastic, the truck that comes is one. Whether I put three bags or four bags, the person who's picking it and putting it into the truck to take it to Dandora all puts it at one place. So when counties do recommend strategies, and, and I believe that is the purpose of the tools that you have in the CIDP and CADP, they should go beyond being just spatial plans, yes, but also uh, plans in terms of uh, what? Strategy. So. Is it okay that I've thrown the, the county, the, 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 the challenge back to you? It is your responsibility to say in this county, this is how we shall manage waste. And there are so many examples of zero waste cities globally. But once you recommend that, now you have to negotiate with other arms of government, like NEMA, and now you say at policy, you must separate your waste, so we will provide beans or we will penalize you if you mix your waste on the street, you give such, such recommendations. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the questions asked, and I think uh, they're very insightful. I'll try to tackle the one uh, from Zia Abdallah. Uh, some of the observations you've made are quite critical, and I think uh, it's a challenge to the planners, for instance, and those of us in the academia, to really think through how we obtain such kind of information. So when I talked about things going interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary, there is another line of thought called transdisciplinarity. In other words, we do not assume or pretend to own the knowledge. It's not a monopoly of those who go to school, so to speak. But communities on the ground living amongst those natural resources really have a lot of experience and history that can help us. For instance, the disappearance of, the, uh, of some of the birds along the coastal region is attributed to the long-term changes in the ecosystem. Remember, there's that kind of web of relationship I talked about, the predator-prey relationship. When the, prey, when, the pre, uh, when the prey disappears, the predator has got no business staying there. They have also to disappear. And this results from things like you know, anthropogenic causes like we had talked about. When development comes in, people settle in those areas. There's no more space for these birds to find their habitat. Then they are bound to disappear. Overfishing, for instance. When some of the fish species they depend on are over, overfished and therefore they disappear, then the birds that feed of, on them also have to disappear. Beyond that, issues of climate change, for instance. As a result of climate change, some of the species can no longer survive. The conditions become hostile for them, and so they have to move to other areas. In the terrestrial ecosystems, we have some of them moving from the lowlands to the highlands, the forest structures changing, and so birds that live in those kind of trees also migrate. So that relationship then starts to change. The same happens in the seas. Because of those stratifications and loss of certain species, the birds then get replaced. So what happens is what you call the emergence of invasive uh, species, those that can then survive in that newly created ecosystem. So your question is, what do we do about it? For the climate change issues, we have to invest in reversing the trends. I think the projections are that by 2050, at a change of about 1.5 degrees Celsius, we are going to see the disappearance of several mammal species. So what do we do about that? They say, I've given you the information. It is your choice on what to do with it. And remember I said, we are not out of the woods yet. Because when these changes happen, we are part of that system. The ecosystem, we are part of it. And so those changes are going to affect us directly, either through nutrition, loss of cultural services, aesthetic beauty of the environment. So we have to really invest in matters that, that addressed 
that address climate change. Beyond that, human activities, construction of roads, construction of uh, you know, residential estates, creation of different amenities, they have to be specially planned in a way that they don't interfere with the functioning of these ecosystems. So I think that really uh, throws the ball back to us again as human beings to really plan for that. The second question uh, was about, in my understanding, I would say, what resources do we really prioritize? W to what extent do we ensure that uh, you know, our planning captures the appropriate resources? Now, the problem here is that uh, we tend to think that natural resources do not have value. Uh, I think one of the, uh, Professor Iruha mentions, Iruha mentioned something about natural capital. The moment we've attached the word capital to it, already brings, it, uh, brings out the importance of these resources because they are the basic foundation upon which our survival is based. So what we are doing, for instance, now is to try and see how some of these resources can be valued. We attach a dollar sign to them because the thinking now is anything that doesn't have a dollar value is useless. But we've now seen that these ecosystem services really have value. But because we can't show the economists what value they are losing by losing, for instance, an acre of a forest, we are now trying to do what's called natural capital valuation. And the, the things I mentioned we'll be learning next week are about ecosystems valuation. How do we attach value to these resources so that you can discount and say, if you lose this much of forest, we are losing this much money. And what does that translate to in terms of the national GDP? Very critical. So when we are able to value some of these resources, we are able then to start attaching uh, importance to them in a way that's going to help us uh, you know, see how they contribute. The other bit is about the conflict between political and economic ideology. Again, that's quite critical because, like I said, if we do not have a vision that is based on the understanding of what really drives that economy, then we only have a vision that is hanging in the balance. In other words, the foundation is not very strong. I'll give examples of the agenda, uh, I mean the Vision 2030 and the AU Agenda 60, uh, 2063, as well as the SDGs, yeah? So these are very critical uh, you know, targets that have been laid down. But if you bring them down to the operationalization within the context of Kenya, for instance, our driving forces for achieving those agenda as well as the visions is actually linked to either economic prosperity or educating people to contribute to economic development. But we are forgetting about the foundation. Remember, for instance, the economic pillar of the Vision 2030 is actually emphasizing the contribution of tourism. But on the same note, we are also undermining what drives tourism. So for instance, in some of the protected areas in Kenya, you are aware the likes of Standard Gauge Railway, the Lapset, they are all passing through critical ecosystems and without abandon, they are just being damaged. But at the same time, we are told, people are now able to enjoy wildlife while driving through. The question is, for how long is that gonna happen? So because of that kind of lack of vision, we are in a situation where we are progressively depleting those resources at the expense of economic development. So the planning then must think through that. Uh, our, our, our challenge now is these resources, I mean, this uh, infrastructure are already in place. So we can't take them away, but now have to start thinking from there. And what we are now promoting again is something called scenario planning. How do we make use of the challenges we have now and develop different visions? under what we call business as usual, as well as an alternative uh, you know, vision uh, called either green living or environmentally conscious living. So those are critical things we have to think through. And finally, the last question from Alex about anthropogenic issues and the conflicts. I think it's been captured in what I've said in a nutshell, basically trying to discount or have a trade-off. How much are we willing to lose for development at the expense of conservation? And at what time do they come to a point where we can agree just the level of investment in each of them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We'd want to listen to you many, many uh, minutes more. Uh, I think everyone is just attentive. Thank you so much. And my brother from another mother. We have very many mothers in the Ministry of Transport. Uh, <laughs> so I cannot leave my brother. You need to say something just before I usher in our next uh, round of questions from our online uh, participants. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, my sister from another mother. <laughs> uh, by name and 
Governor Wino, architect from State Department for Public Works. The ministry is uh, a sentence. It's Ministry of Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development, and Public Works. Um, I think from, from what the presentations we've had and the questions that have come, I want to play safe because I'm from both sides. I was neither present, I was not a presenter. I was in the, should I call it the congregation? <laughs> but now I'm on this other side, so I can throw questions and I can also answer. And I want to, okay, I want to take it from uh, uh, my brother from Lamu when he asked the question why Lamu had been, uh, why Lamu had not been included. I would, sorry? From Malindi. Yeah, why Lamu had, been, had not been included, and uh, I was going to ask the same question. Um, uh, Dr. Uku here rightly put it that when we are planning the, um, the marine resources, then we must go back to the source. So I was going to ask uh, the question, why are we not talking about the inland, Kisumu and Lake Victoria and other, uh, Mount Kenya, in fact, uh, I think she did mention Mount Kenya, so that Wyomsa is not uh, limited to the Indian Ocean environment, but it can go further to uh, think about those other, those other water sources. And uh, maybe my thinking is, I think again, uh, Dr. Tari here has talked about uh, specific tools for uh, uh, what, uh, ma manage management by, by ecosystem. Ca could we possibly think about developing a tool to evaluate waterfront developments so that uh, where it is applicable, we can apply it within the first stretch that we've seen Malindi has done. Uh, the one I think it's about one kilometer. And if that can be applicable along the 10 kilometer stretch or even beyond from Cape Town to Mogadishu, if it's Lake Victoria throughout uh, from Mombasa, from Kisumu to Tanzania and Uganda. And I think even the uh, minister from, uh, from Uganda mentioned this. We are able to measure urban vulnerability. Should we think about being able to measure uh, waterfront development? Can we come up with tools um, in uh, uh, cooperation with Wyomsa and other bodies so that when evaluating out of front development, we can be able to uh, grade, and then it gives us the basis for competition uh, in terms of developing this uh, environment, because indeed, it's a unique environment. So I want to throw it back to us as uh, planners that we think about developing such tools uh, moving forward. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, my brother. I can harass you the way I want, but I want to mention that uh, the architect shares two registrations. Um, that he's a that corporate, corporate member of AAK, AAK with, with me, with me but, but in a but different, in a chapter. different chapter. chapter. Then you, then you also is a member of, uh, gradu uh, of uh, Kenya Institute of Learners. I am a corporate member. And then uh, he's also registered with the Board of Registration of Architects and Quantity Surveyors of Kenya. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, so now we want to usher in the next round of questions from our online listeners or participants. Uh, Dr. Daktari, oh, I don't want to call you Dr. Valentine, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, um, we have some questions here. Uh, I think um, the first question is from Barre. Um, and he's asking on the experience of planning implementation of SGR and other highways. E.G. Nairobi Expressway, Duo Carriageway, um, the one extending from Limuru. The issues of environmental and ecological uh, diversity needs to be included by those implementing agencies. So how should those Kura, Kenha, and even K K KPA and Kenya Civil Authority approach their large infrastructure projects with a view of resilience and sustainable and, and inclusive development? I think both yourself and uh, Nyumba, you can be able to respond to that, how those organizations that are dealing with infrastructure can, 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 can be able to be sustainable. And then the second question, then the second question is from Mark Mutua, and he's asking this Professor Daniel, uh, with regards to the Beyond Bear Brain, what is the space of reas realizing resilient city planning? 
And then how do we include issues of multiplicity of institutions, issues of climate change and adaptation, and how to back, bounce back from those shocks? I think in Nyumba you can also talk about that, issues of multiplicity of institutions when you are dealing with the projects and how to mitigate that. And Daniel can also put something on issues of um, how we can realize design and developing um, sustainable city. I think then the third question, um, again from Mutua is talking about heat resilient uh, cities. Uh, for example, Sub-Sahara Africa uh, has a lot of heat related climate change. Uh, how can we bridge, and we're having all this because we don't have proper data, so how can we bridge this data and knowledge gap, which is limited, and to help us inform gui uh, and guide policy and practice? I think that uh, uh, architect Josephine, architect Josephine, sorry, can can look at that. Um, and then the fourth question is um, from George Onyango. How is the Internet of Things, smart city and Internet of Things? require that we address uh, the land issue and land, uh, and land tenure. So how can we, ana basically we are analog, how can we do it currently uh, using the Internet of Things? Uh, this is for Professor Irura. I think you can also be able to answer that. Those are the questions that are here currently. For the mic, please, even the speakers, they are complaining that the mics are, are, are low. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Barry, for the question. I think the issue of the SGR and the other highways, or generally infrastructure, and the issues of environmental and social accountability, or what we call environmental and social safeguards, is quite critical. And uh, without belaboring that, the law provides for the uh, you know, conduct of environmental and social impact assessment, or the strategic environmental assessment, when these projects are supposed to be initiated. Uh, the challenge is the process of conducting those, uh, you know, assessments. Uh, and therefore, it is something that really, uh, I think, Kura, Kenha, and maybe NEMA team already, we are working together on trying to address some of those gaps. Enforcement and just, you know, the, the, the environmental impact assessment experts really doing the right thing has always been the challenge. Oh, so I need to stand. <laughs> All right, sorry. Thank you so much, uh, but at least the voice was, was okay, yeah, so I'll just continue. Good, so the, the environmental and social impact assessment processes are always undertaken. And as I mentioned, the challenge is the extent of compliance with those recommendations is where the problem is. So in my view, therefore, I think the challenges on uh, the infrastructure institutions like Kera, Kura, and Kenha, as well as the SGR and other relevant organizations to really do a good job at that. We are working on a document right now to try and recommend certain ways to improve that, including coming with new tools like mitigation hierarchy, as well as, uh, you know, uh, use of scenario planning. There's a tool we've developed called the Kesho Toolkit. Its purpose is to help us visualize really what futures are we looking at insofar as infrastructure development is concerned. About the institutions, I think obviously I did mention that and we've all talked about the conflicts, but my emphasis was we can only participate if there is value for my participation. What is the need for me? I'll emphasize that. It is easier to call people to a meeting, but if they are not committed and you don't have a shared vision, then at the end of the meeting, we'll go back to our institutions and go on with those inst institutional cultures and values that I did mention. Do we share values? Do we share some commonalities? And how do we build on those? Where there are conflicts, how do we resolve those conflicts? Now, these are things that cannot be done by sitting down once. They are a process that must be engaged in uh, on a, uh, at a lengthy uh, you know, process. In terms of the data bridging, I think that was for uh, Professor, not for me. So thank you, thank you so much. Yeah? listen to uh, professor are you still on hello <coughs> yes you uh, yeah okay put um, on your yeah, video I'm please in. okay do you hear me 
Hello? Yes, Hello? we can. Okay. Um, I will tackle the, uh, the one also that uh, I, uh, our, my colleague, uh, panelist, uh, Nyuba has addressed, the question of uh, space for uh, multiplicity of institutions <clears throat> and the question of uh, the shocks. Yeah, the multiplicity of institutions is one of the things that we are kind of trying to, uh, to mitigate in relation to data and the whole question of real data because to give you an example even when it comes to <clears throat> multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity like uh, uh, Anuba, Anuba had said or had highlighted we are still not <clears throat> excuse me we are still not yet training or even educating our professionals today in terms of how to engage in this kind of multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. And the, the few who are there already are, are almost like self-trained. So the process of how you consult across these uh, silos and across these boundaries are too daunting. They are really quite, quite a big challenge and we do not necessarily have the time to actually continue doing it through gradual and slow adaptation. If it takes us 20 years to get an engineer to be able to sit comfortably with a community leader and they agree, th that is time we don't have. So the, the whole idea that we will break these silos purely by intentional, operational, processes, we are not going to give up on it, but at the same time, we know it is not happening at the speed that it should. So the question by which we allow this kind of um, data and the smartness to be available is to help each of them, is to help the engineer understand what the community leader may be concerned about even before they actually consult. And if that process is enhanced and enriched, then there is a way in which we can balance between the gradual process where we learn the skills of multidisciplinarity versus the need for speed when we need to really respond in real time uh, scenarios. So, even as we talk here now, I guess in a panel like this, in a convention like this, we are going through the loops. We are going through that process of retraining ourselves to trespass across boundaries and be comfortable trespassing. But that is not the common thing most professionals are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. More often, they are keeping to the lane. They are keeping to their own fields of expertise are they not daring to cross. So the multiplicity of institutions, the multiplicity of uh, players, I think that is one of the areas where both from a neuroscience and from an artificial intelligence point of view, real data, we can start leveraging that quicker and sooner than, um, uh, than what we can get through the gradual uh, process. I take the question of um, um, heat uh, resistance uh, cities and the bridging the data. I think those are some of the issues that we need to be bringing in because if you look at the data that is now being collected or captured by meteorologists, for example, a lot of that data is lying somewhere in an archive and not always bringing in the picture of how quickly our cities are warming up in terms of this heat island defect and so forth. So if you were in charge of, if you were managing the geo design hub, as I showed in my spot, if you were in charge of the geo design hub and you were in charge of the smart city forum, the responsibility then becomes to make sure that different data centers and different uh, data points 
are being integrated into this smart city. And that's why I say it, it's not about e-governance. It's not about a GIS for a certain specialist. It's about consolidated and open source data that needs to be, uh, to be actually accessed in a regular basis. And also with the intelligence and the AI algorithms that can understand when you are, an, as an architect, you are doing your work, what aspects of this data are relevant to you and how can I then frame this data to actually answer your question? So I think we have been so much, you know, put off by artificial intelligence and thinking it is something so alien that we have not understood how quickly it has matured. And even though it has still got a lot of gaps to, uh, to close, it still has come very far and we need to, to start trusting it. I think what I would do is answer the last part. Uh, there was another a question relating to IoT and LAD tenure system. At this point in time, yes, LAD issues and tenure and uh, registration and uh, rights and so on have been the focus of um, uh, smart data and so forth. However, I would not imagine that we can go far with that if other data issues have also not actually been addressed. In particular, let's assume that it is the affairs who are in charge of this internet of things relating to land tenure. They need to have it there as custodians, as I said, but at the same time, create principles by which these data then become accessible to the town planner, become accessible to the architect, become accessible to the engineer. And this custodianship of data is what we were showing in the spokes when we talked about Mijibora, the four spokes, one relating to geodesign hub, the other one relating to custodianship and quality assurance and so on, the other relating to padding, and then there were other ones relating to the forum. So this custodianship of data, and not imagining it purely as a municipal or a county responsibility, but as a resource that needs to be managed and enhanced for everybody's benefit, and getting the right resources and the funding and expertise, like data scientists, for example. If you don't have a data scientist, then you are not talking about as much anything yet. Because the data scientist is the one who then knows what algorithms you need and how to train those algorithms and then be able to generate uh, responses from those data sources, depending on whether it is the mayor who asked the question or depending on whether it is the engineer who needs the answer. So if you don't have a data scientist, all you are accumulating is data pool. But there is no learning, and there is no expertise, and there is no intelligence that is coming with that data. So that's how I would respond to that um, land tenure question. It's not static. AI, IoT is not a static thing. It entails the learning of these algorithms so that they are up to speed to give you real-time responses as you get to need them. Thank you, thank you, Prof. Uh, we can hear you loud and clear. It's um, uh, imagining that we want to discuss with you much more. Maybe you organize for us a class online and we learn much more, uh, not just the content, but also your language. Uh, I believe everyone understands that. Uh, so I will not give my uh, other panelists time to respond now because I know it could have provoked some um, responses. But I want to invite some other round of queries. Very quick, each person one minute. Online, we have more questions. I could see some um, conversation. Uh, advise us if it's uh, just an input or a query so that we know whether we've engaged our panelists. Uh, actually, it's a question by Rose. Uh, she's worried that artificial intelligence and the um, Internet of Things will replace humans. 
and so people will face job losses. And she thinks uh, that if we have smart cities, people are going to lose jobs. So probably Irura can comment on that. Yeah, yeah, we can I'll put on the chat, and then she somebody is asking an update on the implementation of the Lamu uh, spatial plan. So I think somebody can respond to that. Lamu uh, spatial planners can respond to that on the chat, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lena Kilesi. Let me first of all appreciate uh, the brilliant presentation you made this morning. Uh, my question my is, question is a sort of a, a cross-cutting cross question. question, and it has to do yes, with, um, with um, before, before we offer, we offer these uh, solutions, solutions to address uh, issues, issues around resources, resources. How, do how do we institutionalize, institutionalize our own, our, our, how do we change our own attitudes our towards this, in the, in the sense in of, sense um, of um, having a mental shift, shift or looking around our ethos uh, towards this environment uh, concerns. If you look at uh, issues of, um, uh, for example, all these uh, approaches are towards making these resources work for us as a person at the center. I think uh, Dr. Nyumba was uh, speaking that we need also to discuss ourselves alongside uh, these resources. So, and, and it goes, or even uh, Professor Irura talking about technology, addressing some of these challenges that we have. But then, can we step backward and uh, think about our ethos and how we can uh, make it part of our solutions uh, in addressing some of these uh, resources? So, I, I don't know whether it's really a question, but uh, if you have any idea towards how we can institutionalize our ethos as part of solutions to this uh, resources concern. Thank you. Last question. Last question. Very last Very one. Last one. Uh, Abdallah, you, you want to talk again? Talk again? Uh, responding, uh, responding to, to LAMU implementation? implementation? No, no, a question. A question. Just, just a minute. minute. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just one, one minute. minute. Thank you very much indeed, my dear madam, the mistress of the, what you call, ceremony. Um, I'm surprised to know that a good number of Kenyans are here. They are from various parts of the country. Coincidentally, I am not seeing any representative from Tana River. Were they not involved in this function? Because Tana River is one of the areas that drought, I mean, goes there very frequently, like now. So please, have, they, have these people not... Uh, considered as uh, participants of this particular thank you very much planners tana river we have any planner no no all right maybe we'll have them tomorrow they will oh yeah okay, okay. so we just listen to everyone uh, you have too many questions we want to listen to the architect because i also share the same uh, <laughs> Uh, professional body with you. Yeah. Thank, you. Um, thank, thank you so thank much. You so much. Uh, session, session chair, if you'll allow me to comment, to comment on, on data, data, data science. Data science. Um, um, as, as, as Professor Irura said, said, we generate a lot of data and it sits in silos. silos. But the reason the we reason don't talk to each other is because data is a language. And different professionals and different sectors have different data needs. So there's a terminology called data interoperability, where the data that you generate can be used by everybody. I'll give you an example from academia. We do so many researches and find a lot of data, but the kind of language we speak, yes? The, the person from the community that Dr. Nyumba is talking in transdisciplinary research will ask, what does that have to do with me? Because the data is there, it is in silos, but we have to find a way to translate that data into something that everybody can use. So sometimes, and, and there has been a lot of discussions in, in, in the world of data science regarding data interoperability, so that when we generate uh, data, for instance, on policy, on waste management, how will a person in the Ministry of Health use it? How do we do that? 
Are we okay? That is where GIS comes in. So the data you have, they put it on a map. There are people who need it on a map. There are people who need it in another format. So this big data that's being generated, sometimes the problem is not so much the data, but the interoperability. So we sort of need translators who can translate to different people. There are different data needs. Um, thank you for obliging me. Then maybe I can respond on the question of ethos. And this is on all matters, environment, including how we work together as transdisciplinary research. Um, I believe one of the key stakeholders that is cross-cutting is the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology. Some of these things, we have to put them in the curriculum from kindergarten. There is no other way. And that is what they do in Singapore. Singapore, those children go to school, they are taught your environment is important, you must green your environment, public participation, you have a voice. So some things we cannot teach you at university or when you are a planner. Yes? Some of these things you need to inculcate them in the curriculum. CBC, you give CBC assignment, go plant trees. Separate your waste. That is my personal view because that is how we do early childhood development. By the time you're 12, everything is baked in. Anything you're taught over 12 is, there are things that are baked in, you go to default. So that is my response to how to inculcate it. In the same way, transdisciplinary research, we've had these discussions, it has to be in the curriculum. I'm an architect, I was trained in JQuart. In, in my professional field, I'll meet quantity surveyors, engineers, surveyors, planners, you understand? But when we did our classes, we did our we classes did our in one classes faculty, faculty, they did their classes in another faculty. We used to say hello on the corridors. But when I come out here, I think I need a civil engineer. But for six years of university, they were here. I don't know them. So we also have to start training common courses across disciplines. A lot of it is education. So that when we start needing each other, we are not meeting for the first time out here. We, we are meeting. You know the way you know someone in primary, and then you're like, oh, you. So I, I think a lot of it goes back to education. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just realized we never shared the same uh, block that we shared with my brother at the University of Nairobi. Uh, so we, you want to respond to something? Just before Prof uh, responds to the issue of uh, balancing between technology and loss of jobs. You want to say something? All right. Uh, prof, uh, prof, professor, professor, please okay, respond um, yeah, to that, Mataya. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity and the, the question. There are, uh, there are two ways to actually look at this issue of AI, artificial intelligence, algorithms, and uh, the internet of things. Um, the one thing that is very clear, that that's why I brought it up in my own presentation. I brought it out up front because it's one of the challenges we have to learn how to, to actually deal with. First and foremost, let us accept it that it is coming, okay? Because billions of dollars are being invested in creating algorithms. AI, in, you know, artificial intelligence is not something tomorrow that will come tomorrow or 20 years. It is an ongoing thing. By the way, even as we are actually on this uh, session and we are, some of us are online, we have been analyzed and we are being tracked and we are being, you know, monitored so that certain things can be balanced to favor whatever, whatever endeavor we have actually set ourselves for. And it is not possible by any imaginary way to actually manipulate these things in an analog sense by whoever it might be. So the AI is working. Even now as we engage online, the AI is behind the scenes and they're working. The only question is, when will AI come to your job? When will it come to your planner job? When will it come to your architect job? Some of us might think that is 20 years down the line, and I say no. If it is not on your job in another five years, bet on another 20 years. 
10 years, for uh, sorry, 10 years, a lot of the things that we think we are doing as experts and we are irreplaceable, they're gonna have a, what do they call uh, expert assistant for you who will obviously be an algorithm. And the more, and it will help you in a lot of the data issues that we are talking about that you cannot fathom by your bare brain. So it's a question of whether you accept that this is the destiny because AI is being evolved and invested in and creating entrepreneurs and startups in possibly the, as the highest rate compared to any other field in information technology. So that's the one way to accept it and to understand it. So you don't sit comfortably saying that your job is pro it is not protected. But look at it then the other way around. Uh, so Just yes, like sir. the whole the question whole of uh, sustainability uh, and so on is, is a future, uh, an issue an we issue are starting, starting to mitigate and to enhance in the future. future. This, this agile, agile, creating the agile, agile professional, professional, creating the agile, agile citizen, the citizen who can change with speed. speed. If this queue is uh, replaced with the algorithms, then what is your chance of picking up a new skill and all that? So the whole idea about creating communities and the people of agility, so that once they get this place in this side, they can pick up speed on something else. That's a responsibility now. We hear you, now. Prof. We, hear you, prof. Uh, we are very okay. loud and clear. Uh, so that plus, to me is the, way, the two ways I wish I could approach it, yeah. Thank you. Uh, plus new terminologies. Some of us are, uh, are actually on the Google just to find out the meaning of professor's uh, language. Uh, thank you very much. It's adding value, uh, a lot of value. And uh, I think we need to engage you more and more. Uh, with that, I think we, if there's no other uh, from uh, our online distant, uh, participants, I think we carry forward to other se se sessions within the day and even tomorrow and the other days. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, my brother. Thank you very much, uh, Utu, uh, not Daktari. Thank you very much, Nyomba, and uh, thank you very much, Muchogo. Yeah, and uh, you may take your seats. Thank you, Anna.